This morning, we're going, to, we're going to begin a series of sermons which will take us through and explore six statements that are central to the Presbyterian Church USA, as it is called to be a, the body of Christ in the world. These statements are known as the great ends of the church, and they're found in the Foundations of Presbyterian Polity section of the Book of Order, Volume 2 of our Constitution. These statements detail how the church responds to its call to be the body of Christ. They affirm how the church is, is to be faithful to the mission of Christ as it proclaims and hears the word of God, administers and receives the sacraments, and nurtures a covenant community of disciples of Christ. The six great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social right righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. Our topic this morning is the first great end, the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. But before we dive into the details, I want to set the stage for how I will, I will present my thinking in this series. In my message on May 8th, I introduced the work of Simon Sinek, author of the book, Start With Why. I said Sinek's message for business is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. For the church, this idea translates as people will not join the church because of what the church does. People will join the church when they understand why the church is in mission to the world. Simon Sinek's process can be visualized as these three concentric circles. The innermost is why. This is the clear and concise statement of the organization's core purpose and reason for being. Next is how. How does the organization accomplish its why? The outermost circle is what. This is the product of the organization's efforts and actions. When an organization starts with why and works outward to what, then it begins by telling people its purpose and core beliefs. Often those have little to do with what they do. But starting with why lets people know why the organization exists. The next step is to let people know how the organization goes about transforming those core beliefs into its why, into what the organization produces, goods and services that are of real use in the real world. I will apply this and use this same way of thinking throughout this sermon series. The church's why is captured in the opening statement of section F-1.03 of the Book of Order. It says there, the church is the body of Christ. Christ gives to the church all gifts necessary to be his body. Why does the church exist? The church exists to be the body of Christ in the world. That is a clear and straightforward statement of the church's why. How the church goes about being the body of Christ is where the great ends of the church come into the discussion. For today, the answer to the question, how does the church live into its call to be the body of Christ, is by proclaiming the gospel for the salvation of humankind. Before we go on, a bit of a sidebar is in order. The question, what is the word of God, has multiple answers. Jesus Christ is the word incarnate. Emmanuel, 
God with us. The Bible is the word written in Holy Scripture. The sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism are the word enacted. And preaching and teaching that is faithful to Scripture is the word proclaimed. So, what we mean when we say the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind is the faithful preaching and teaching so that all can experience God's saving grace. The example chosen to illustrate the proclamation of the gospel is the passage from Luke that I read earlier. What better place to begin a consideration of the power of the proclamation of the gospel than the record of Jesus' own first sermon. Immediately after his baptism by John, Luke tells us that the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the desert where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. When that trial ended, our lesson for today begins. The first thing that we learn is that Jesus was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit when he returned to Galilee and began his public ministry there. We're told that Jesus taught in the synagogues in the region and that his message was well received by all who heard him. Things seemed to be going great right up until Jesus made his way back to his hometown of Nazareth. When the Sabbath rolled around, Jesus did what he always did. He went to the local synagogue to teach, and he began by reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, the passage that we know as Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. What happened next is truly astonishing. The speaker in the passage from Isaiah is obscure, perhaps a priest. That speaker claims that he received the Spirit of the Lord and was anointed to particular ministries. When Jesus finished reading and sat down, he added the exclamation point. He told the congregation that what they had just heard fulfilled the scriptures. In doing so, Jesus identified himself as the one anointed, the Messiah who had received the Spirit of the Lord. The passage from Isaiah is then a preview of Jesus' ministry on earth, to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. There can be no doubt that this was a jaw-dropping moment in that Nazareth synagogue. At first, the reaction within the congregation was positive, and there seemed to be a sense of pride that Joseph's boy had done well for himself. But the longer Jesus preached, the angrier the crowd became, until they yanked him out of the building and were about to throw him off a cliff. But Jesus walked back through the crowd and left town, and there's no record that Jesus ever visited his hometown again. While it can be argued that Jesus preached more memorable sermons, the Sermon on the Mount certainly comes to mind, the lesson from Luke today serves as an excellent example of what it looks like to proclaim the gospel for the salvation of humankind. Jesus made clear in his preaching that he was anointed to save people. And while the scripture identifies only certain types of people, the poor, captives, the blind, and the oppressed, we can readily think in more expansive terms. The poor in spirit, captives to addictions and lives of drudgery, people blind to the truth of the gospel, and the oppressed who fall outside of God's grace. It's not hard to extend the list in the passage to all of humankind. The first of the great ends of the church takes on a lot. 
the salvation of humankind. In recent sermons, I've talked frequently about salvation. Recall that two weeks ago, I quoted N.T. Wright saying, being saved doesn't just mean, as it does for many today, going to heaven when they die. It means knowing God's rescuing power, the power revealed in Jesus, which anticipates in the present God's final great act of deliverance. But salvation can't only be about rescuing us when we do bad things. Instead, it must be about restoring us to lives of doing good things. It must be about restoring us to living in right relationships with our Creator God. Salvation must be about forgiveness and reconciliation so that we live in the peace of God's grace. Salvation's not just for Presbyterians, even though this statement is part of our Constitution. And it's not just for good church-going folk in Christian denominations, or even the morally upright non-churched people, but for everyone, humankind. The statement reminds me of the NPR program, All Things Considered. Not many things considered, or the important things considered, but all things considered. I guess I'll be listening for a while. The point is that the church seeks to provide a message of good news of Jesus Christ that is offered to everyone. So, what about that message? In what ways do we proclaim the gospel so that all can be saved? Perhaps the most obvious is what we're doing right now, preaching and hearing a sermon. I said earlier that preaching and teaching that is faithful to scripture is the word proclaimed, but you don't have to take my word for it. The second Helvetic Confession in the Book of Confessions, part one of our Constitution, makes this clear. It says, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. The directory of worship in the Book of Order adds, the word proclaimed shall be based on the word written in scripture. The person standing in the pulpit on Sunday morning is not in this preaching business alone. In 1989, Thomas G. Long published his seminal book, The Witness of Preaching. It's currently in its third edition and has become a standard for teaching homiletics in our seminaries. If I were to take a missionary job in some remote place and could only bring along five books and a Bible with me, this book would be one of them. Dr. Long makes several statements in the book that leave no doubt that the preacher and the congregation form a collaboration whenever a sermon is preached. The first statement is this, that the preacher is the one whom the congregation sends on their behalf, week after week, to the scripture. The church knows that its life depends upon hearing the truth of God's promise and claim through the scripture, and it has set the preacher apart for the crucial task of going to scripture to listen for that truth. I'm here because all of you have sent me to find truth in the, written, and in the written word of God on your behalf. The second statement is actually your responsibility. You should come to worship every Sunday and expect an answer to the question, is there a word today, a word for us from the Lord? If the preacher has done the job, the answer will be, yes, I have gone to scripture and let me tell you what I learned. The third key point that Dr. Long makes is this. A written sermon is a contradiction in terms. A sermon occurs not in the writing, 
but in the preaching. A sermon, by definition, is a spoken event. Sermons are experienced, not just written and read. If the preacher were only to prepare a written manuscript, then the event of preaching would be lost. It's important to keep in mind that whenever preaching happens, as many sermons are delivered as there are hearers in the pews. That's because everyone hears things a little differently based on their attentiveness, understanding, and experience with the scripture. Dr. Long says that the hearer is a co-creator of the sermon. And a sermon preached to 75 people is actually transformed into 75 more or less related sermons. Preaching must be more than just something we do out of habit because that's what we've always done as part of worship every Sunday. In our Presbyterian tradition, sermons have often had a scholarly air about them, like the introductory chapter of a Master of Theology thesis. But they must also be accessible to the collaborators, the hearers in the congregation. Every preacher, especially this one, must keep in mind that their job is to proclaim the gospel for the salvation of humankind in words that are faithful to scripture and familiar to the hearers. Because it is in that word for us today, a word from the Lord, that we come to know God's grace and saving love for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.